Good morning, and it's Monday. Well, praise the Lord that we have another day to give thanks to the Lord for what He wants to do and will continue to do in our lives. Amen. We've been talking a lot about the word holy, and we've been in Exodus, and there was lots of things to discuss in Exodus about holy. And we probably have today and tomorrow, we'll see yet, before we move on from this whole idea of holiness and how we move on into the further into the scriptures where it uses the word holy. But for today, we're going to do, you could sort of say, part two of the holy tabernacle. And uh, we see here again, just for those of you who might be first timers uh, to watching us, this is Discipleship Empowerment Word. We're talking about the holy tabernacle. And we know that in the tabernacle, it's divided into three areas. You can't see it very well, maybe, because there's just a little string here across the two areas. But we have the outer court, we have the holy place, and then we have the holy of holies. Here, the Levites, uh, who were in charge of taking care of the daily sacrifices, often twice daily, and were was done on the altar, here of uh, sacrificing for atonement. This was a basin for water. We are, again, we're not trying to exp explain all the parts, how they're relevant to us, but just to let you know in the bigger picture when it comes to this word holy, uh, because we, we have within this holy tabernacle, we have these pieces, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the uh, light or the oil, the manal, and uh, then we also have the Ark of the Testimony and or the Ark of the Covenant, which is here. And then we talked about inside how uh, we have uh, a, a vessel of manna, we have Aaron's rod, and we have the Ten Commandments. And then sitting on top of all that, of course, is the mercy seat which represents the presence of God. And we know that as the blood was shed here and shed around here, also on the altar of incense that the blood had to be shed and also sprinkled on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So we want to bring that all into attention because now we're going to talk about the tabernacle a little bit different than we did uh, the other day, where we want to talk about it today as uh, the the whole tabernacle as, a, as itself. We have holy parts, but it, as we said, it was also known as the holy tabernacle. And, and we shared yesterday, and maybe some of you didn't realize it, and it's important to what we're going to uh, talk about today, because... Around the tabernacle, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. So on one side, there would be three. On another side, there would be three. Then on another side, there would be three. And another side would be three. And then we also have the tent of Moses. So it's it's all these things are going on, and they're important to understand these things. Because when you get into the New Testament and talk about the tabernacle or the holy things of God or whatever... Uh, p different pieces that we're talking about it uh it we need to know the background information because we said that the the new testament builds on the old testament and this is why like today uh we want to talk about how the tribes were around the outside and on the tabernacle we have a cloud by day and fire by night and we had mentioned how that was an amazing thing so because the idea of that is so that all the people around the tabernacle would know that the presence of god was there and they would know the presence of god both by day and by night uh, i mean can you imagine what it would have been like to be in your tents around the tabernacle and I and I'm sure it's not just some little cloud that was four inches off the top of the of the tent itself. I'm sure it was a big cloud and that all could be seen from the whole million or so people that were around representing the twelve tribes of Israel. 
And we know the 12 tribes of Israel were important because we're going to maybe tomorrow talk about the holy garments. And there we will see that part of the breastplate that, that uh, Aaron wears is 12 precious stones, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel. So when Aaron, as the high priest, came in, he's coming in and representing all 12 tribes. He's representing all the people. I like that because I, <clears throat> I used to say to a lot of people when I was pastoring, I just don't represent our local church. I'm a pastor to our community. I want to represent all our people who live in our community. And some people found that was hard to believe. And I would say to them, sometimes as I was working with people, you know, the best church that you should go to is to that one over there or to that one over there. And sometimes I wouldn't recommend our church, you know, and people would get upset at me and they'd say, well, you know, we're trying to build our church. No, we're trying to build God's people. And Aaron was going to represent all the people of Israel before a holy God, <clears throat> before uh, in the tabernacle. And so the cloud would be over top so that all the people, remember, and, and Jesus brings this up later and the, and the Jews get upset about it because he's now come for all the people, both Jew and Gentile. Do you understand that? And so a lot of the Jews at first didn't like them, like that. Well, the Gentiles need to do this. The Gentiles need to do that. The Gentiles need to keep circumcision and on and on and on. You know, the Gentiles needed to keep the holy, the, the holy celebrations. And, 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 and Jesus and Paul and the other disciples, when they wrote letters saying, no, the gospel came to all the people. And so this holy tabernacle was for all the people. Are you realizing that? Are you seeing that? Because we're going to build on that in a few moments here. And so as the presence of God was there by day and by night. And then the other interesting thing is, so we have the cloud that is up over the tabernacle and then the fire that is there by, by night. And the key thing that I like to see here was not only were these uh, two symbols or emblems of God's presence there but God told Moses that when the when the cloud was gone or the fire was gone it was time to pack up and move and I like that too because God is not trying to keep us always in one place and he had opportunities to move them from place to place throughout the wilderness and the things that interest me about that whole idea of packing up and moving on, because when we go on into the New Testament, Jesus said, what does he say to the disciples? You know, uh, follow me. Follow me, for I will make you fishers of men. And so here, the idea is when the cloud raised up and moved and was beginning to move on, the tabernacle, which represented how we could come into the presence of God and have a personal relationship with God was to move on to. And wherever that cloud or that fire went, they were to follow. And I thought that was an interesting thought too, because we as a people, we are called to be followers of Christ. So wherever he leads me, we will follow. Not my will, O oh Lord, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's all these little things that are going on that a lot of times when we read through them, we just skip over them so quickly. But we need to remember this was a holy uh, tabernacle. It was representing a holy God who was going to lead his people in the wilderness through difficult and challenging times, and lead them into the promised land. And once they got to the promised land, of course, then the, tab the, the temple uh, was built. And then at that point, it became uh, where they could see. And, and if you think about it, Jerusalem is on a mountain. 
and the temple would be up there. The temple temple mount would be up there, and again, all the people would be able to see in a lot of parts of the area. Now, I mean, a long ways away, they wouldn't, but they would definitely be able to know, and they would make pilgrimages up to the temple. But right now, we're just talking about the holy tabernacle. And the reason why I want to bring this up, because there's a phrase that goes on uh, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and actually goes on throughout, and we won't look at all of them, but we want to look at about the second part of the thing that I wanted to draw attention to concerning the whole area of the holy tabernacle was that it was a place of meeting. Uh, and when you go to the New King James Bible, it uses, if we turn now to Exodus chapter 29, verse 42, and it says in verse or 29, yeah, Exodus 29, verse 4, I should say. And it says, And Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And then it goes down to verse 10. And you shall have the bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting. And verse 11. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Again, over in verse 30. And when he enters the tabernacle, meaning to minister to in the holy place. Verse 32. By the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Down to verse 42. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout the generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You know, verse 44, consecrate the tabernacle of the meeting. So you, you can see just there alone in chapter 29, how this is used over and over again. The, the tabernacle was to be a meeting place, a place that we meet with God. And as we move into the New Testament, the tabernacle is a place where we also meet with God. Now you say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, we become the new tabernacle. We are to house and carry about within us the Holy Spirit. It's a place where we meet with God. That's why we pray. That's why we do the things that we do, because we're there to meet with God. Now, where I want to just kind of bring some thoughts to place to, to play was, in the New King James and other places, they, they put down, it was, you know, the tabernacle of the meeting. And that sounds good. It sounds like a, you know, when you think of the word meeting, well, I'm going to a meeting. And it could be, you know, two or three people going to a meeting, right? But the King James, I think, uses a better word, <laughs> And the better word, let me go and, and just read it to you from the King James Bible. Those same verses in 2940, or 20, chapter 29, verse 4. And bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 10, the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 11, the tabernacle of the congregation. Again, over in verse 30, the tabernacle of the congregation. 32, the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 42, the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 44, the tabernacle of the congregation. And I like that. The reason why I like that, because when you think of a meeting, sometimes you're, you individually are going to a meeting. You know, I got a meeting this afternoon at 5 o'clock, and so I go. But here, the King James is giving the idea, this is the tabernacle of the congregation. And what was expected, the idea of congregation meant the whole body of people. It didn't necessarily mean one or two. And I think that's important, that this was put together by God, so that the whole congregation of the people of Israel would meet here. Or to put it the other way, another way, that the 
uh, tabernacle, the holy tabernacle, was the center of all that they were to do. So whatever, whether they were traveling or moving or eating or gathering manna or or going out and getting quails, all all those things, we don't understand it because we don't see the bigger picture. But this was to be the center for the congregation. Not just for Moses and Aaron and a few Levites. And that's the, that's the thing that we seem to come out of often. We think, well, that's just for the really, really religious people. No, the Holy Tabernacle was for everybody. Yes, there was a few that were anointed and set apart to do the service of the work with inside the tabernacle. I get that. But the tabernacle was there for all people. All people could bring an offering. All people could gather outside and pray. All people could cry out to the Lord. Because the tabernacle was representing the presence of God. Cloud by day and fire by night. And it was for the congregation. That's why you say, well, pastor, you're taking a lot of time on this because I want to take a lot of time on it because we have got away for thinking that when we, when we gather in, in the presence of the Lord, it's just not for us, which is important that we can have that personal relationship, but it's for the body of Christ. The whole congregation needs to come together. And, and we need to get that. And, and the thing is, this word, the meeting of the congregation, is used probably two to three hundred times in Genesis, Exodus, or I should say Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's a lot of times. For sure over a hundred. The, the holy place, the holy tabernacle, was the place where people could come and meet as a body, as a group, before God. And what I want, what, and, and you say you may not notice it, but often God, Moses would go up and talk to God, and God would say, go down and tell the people, or go out and tell the people. And the people would talk to Moses, and Moses would go in and talk to God. But there was always, Moses was the God-ordained one who was called to become before the presence of God uh, and, and, and be able to take what God speaks and give it to the people. So it was supposed to be God was a God for the people, not just for the individual. The individual is a part, but we need to think, we need to get move this into the New Testament where Jesus has come, yes, for the individual people. But we sometimes forget he's also come for this church. And we forget that in the last days, he's gathering his church together to be his bride. He's not marrying at the marriage supper of the Lamb one person or us individually. <laughs> he's marrying us all as a congregation people who have come to a holy God who has represented himself through his shed blood as the Lamb of God and, and uh, our high priest. And he is there in our midst through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have a cloud of during the daytime and fire by night. Why? Because we can have the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in us. Remember we said, a lot of this was external. It was a, a blueprint of what God was going to require of them. But then as it moved into the new covenant, it became a blueprint of what God wanted to do inside of us. And what he wants to do inside is he wants us to not only meet with him, but meet corporately with him in spirit and in truth. Are you seeing that? Well, we continue on as we look at this because it's important. I, I, I want to show that as we go over into Le Leviticus, and I, I want to just pick up a couple of other verses. So our first one was Exodus 29, verses 42 to 44. Then we go over into Leviticus. And again, in Leviticus uh, chapter 
uh, 1 verse 1. It, I mean, here it's spelled out right in the very beginning, and you may not even see it. I didn't notice it until I was studying it, that God was preparing a holy tabernacle for a chosen people. And that they were to meet together. He goes on here. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of the meeting or the tabernacle of the congregation. God spoke out to Moses to speak to him. And he goes on, verse 3, This, if, if his offering is a burnt offering or a hurt, a hurt, let him offer a male without blemish and shall offer it of his own free will. So he's talking about people bringing an offering. And they will bring that offering with their own free will at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord. So they bring, this is the holy tabernacle, the tabernacle of the congregation. They bring their offering there and offer it up. And then the blood would be shed and be used, well, once a year for uh, to be put on the altar. And again, once a year, that was for atonement for what? The congregation. Daily was for atonement and that for the individuals who would bring in their sacrifice and it would be the blood would be shed and and sprinkled around and it would be sprinkled on the altar of incense twice daily there's an interesting thought so much we can learn from this and again if you if you don't see that idea of the um tabernacle of the congregation you go over into leviticus 3 and he heard of the offering and killed it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 13, the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 14, tabernacle of the congregation. Or verse 4, verse 5, tabernacle. I love this one. That it says, then the anointed, the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the meeting. Now, one thing I noticed here a little bit, and I and I didn't have time to clarify it, but there was the general holy tabernacle of the congregation, but also it seems to talk about the door, bringing it to the door before that there was going to be also a meeting, a very specific meeting place, and to bring that blood. Verse 7, again, uh, tabernacle congregation used twice in, in the game verse 15 16 18 you know it, that's just just that's just one chapter the tabernacle of the congregation and they were to do the, the and the reason why we look at leviticus because leviticus is, is spelling out the work of the the levites what they should be doing and how they should serve in the tabernacle of the congregation how they should work in the tabernacle of the congregation, how they should bring the blood and offer the blood in the tabernacle of the congregation. And even, even in chapter 3, where he talks about how the Levites who were servants, he, he says something very interesting in chapter 3. And I should just bring about this uh, just for interest sake. Verse 12, he says... Uh, Chapter 3, verse 12. Okay, let me see if I got the right chapter. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> uh, we're going to move into to numbers now and have a look at it too. So we see that it was a meeting place, a place to offer sacrifice, and it was done as a free will unto the Holy Lord at his holy tabernacle for his glory. Isn't that, isn't that a beautiful picture? Are, are you seeing this? The tabernacle of the congregation. Let's, let's just quickly go over. Our time is really going on here. In Numbers chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, and this is what I wanted to point out here. In Numbers 3, uh, he gives to us here, Chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And he says to them, And all shall attend 
to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation to do the work of the tabernacle, of the holy tabernacle. Also they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle, the meeting, and the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle. So here he's talking about the Levites and what they were to be doing um, and how they must how they are called to serve him. And I think that's so critical that we see that they are called to serve him. And he goes on, he says, Now behold, I myself, in verse 12, have taken the Levites among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. And I thought, oh boy, that's an interesting part. The ones who are priests, the ones who are serving they are set aside as God, as his. They are mine, he is saying. Wow. Can you see how all this would move into the New Testament? Well, we want to just quickly go over to Deuteronomy chapter 31. I, I'm just trying to pick up all these uh, few little thoughts here. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, there is something that's going to go on here that is coming towards the end of Moses' journey with the people in the wilderness, just before they go into the promised land. And Moses is going to give a prophetic word that if Israel doesn't keep coming before the tabernacle, the holy tabernacle, and keep worshiping God and keeping him center in their thinking and in their journey, he's going to tell them what happens. And not only that, God's going to tell Moses to write it down. And not only that, but to make it into a song. So they don't forget. So we got in, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 15. Now the Lord peered at the tabernacle in the pillar of a cloud. And the pillar of a cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And... Uh, he, he begins to talk about, Moses, how there's a time coming down the road when the people will rebel. Even though that they have all of this in the front of them, right in front of their face daily. Can you imagine? They're still going to rebel. And I guess that's the free will of man. <laughs> we are rebellious people. But the thing is, we need not to, re, you know, re, be in a spirit of rebellion. We need to be a spirit of deliverance and, and followers of Jesus Christ. Because he goes on and he talks about them that later. He says, Arise again, and, and then in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face. I like this a little bit because what what is going on here? Because they're used to, you know, the face of God is represented right here. The face of God is represented in the cloud and that. And because they forsake the Lord, God says, I'm going to hide my face. It's like it's almost talking about here, and we'll take these out of here. It's almost talking that the Lord is going to do this. He's going to turn so they can't see his face. Now here it's a little bit difficult to tell because it looks like the same on the both sides. But a lot of the scriptures would often talk about the presence of God being right in the ear, speaking to, to those who he had called to speak. And so he was going to hide their face because of their evilness. And then he goes, as he goes down, he says a couple more things that are interesting here. He says, now therefore write down this song for yourself and teach it to the children of Israel. So he's gonna he's called to write down a song about God and his holy tabernacle. He goes on in verse twenty two. Therefore Moses wrote this song in the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. You know, one of the best ways to teach theology and teach about God is through songs. And that's what hymns did. Hymns, you know, when we used to sing from the hymns, I always called it a book the hymn book as systematic theology. Because it would teach us about God. And so God was now speaking to Moses and saying, I want you to write about the tabernacle. I want you to write about what God has done. And I want you to put a song together that if they become disobedient, 
and turn from me, this is what's going to happen. I want it burned into their memories. So you could say that the Lord wanted them to know this is what will take place. And it goes in verse 24. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of the law in the book, when he had finished, he goes on verse 26, he take this book of the law and put it be, beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God, that it may be there as a witness against you or against the people. So write down what he wrote down. All this is he had wrote down, you know. And the first, of the, we call it the Pentateuch. And put it as a witness towards or before the people. So I want to end today by reminding us, this is a holy tabernacle that was presented, put together for us, architect and engineered by God put in the midst of the people so people could see God's presence daily, just like we can have God's presence daily. And that when the tabernacle moved, they were to move. And there was people who were called to be servants of the Lord within the holy tabernacle. I mean, so much truth if we would just gather together. And that God wanted to remind them daily that this is his way, this is his truth, and this is how we can have life in him. And he calls the tabernacle, he calls the people to the tabernacle of the congregation. People were not just to do it by ourselves, but they were to come together with other brothers and sisters and praise God and worship God and glorify God and move together with God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at this whole idea of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Lord, help us all to be part of that tabernacle of the congregation. Help us to move not only as an individual, but to move together. Help us, O oh Lord, to see that you are the focal point of all the people. You are the head. We are the body. I mean, Lord, we, we see that you are coming for a bride. And Lord, the bride is the body. And Lord, that we are being called together for the marriage supper of the Lamb. So Lord, I just thank you for these insights that you give to us and the things that you teach us about your holiness, about who you are, and about the holy tabernacle that you prepared for your people. And we thank you, Jesus, how you brought all that from being external to being internal by what you did on the cross for us. So just guide and direct us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. And don't forget, don't forget, we love you. <laughs> and God loves you. Amen. Bye-bye for now.